Hey guys, so right now it's 2017, and believe it or not, this is the 40th anniversary of the very first time I ever played video games. I grew up with them, I was part of the first generation that grew up with video games, and video games also grew up with me. Uh, I've changed a lot over those four decades, and games have changed a lot as well. And I wanted to talk a little bit about how games have changed, how I've changed, and how those two things kind of don't always get together in the same way that they used to. One of my favorite YouTubers out there is the immortal John Hancock, and if you don't follow his channel, you probably should look him up. He's got a great channel. He talks about a lot of stuff. He's got a huge collection of games. He did a video on this subject a week or two ago. It kind of reminded me that I wanted to do the same thing. Um, so this is kind of a response to that, but also kind of my own thing. Hopefully you find this interesting. It is going to be kind of vloggy, but uh, let's just get into it. Now, 1977 and 78 were a couple of big years in gaming, and also for me as well, as far as games that I played. 77, I don't remember exactly what months or what came first, but 77 was the first year that I played Apple II. It was the first time I ever saw or played Bally Astrocade and, of course, Atari VCS. My cousins um, were some of the most tech-forward people, I think, around, and they bought an Atari VCS as soon as it came out. They also were a bit wealthy. I remember they had a great stereo system, and they had an Atari VCS. So I was down there. I, was, I remember playing Combat quite a bit. And uh, I don't remember what other games they had, but uh, this was at launch, so there wouldn't have been too many. Bally Astrocade, a friend of mine had. Um, I don't remember what games they had, but I do remember playing that. And I remember the first time going over to a friend's house, and he had an Apple II complete with... It was just... It was a mess, really, but it was great. And uh, this is kind of what cemented in my mind what a computer and computer gaming should be. He had an Apple II with an open case, everything kind of just hanging out. He had just he had cards with just cords and wires everywhere, and he had stacks of games. Um, and I remember very specifically playing Wizardry. So that was kind of my introduction to RPGs, but I also started out with the very earliest game consoles and arcades. And arcades are something that obviously modern gamers don't really have the experience of the same way that we did. I was basically Matthew Broderick in war games. Every week, if not every couple of days, I would be down at our local arcade pumping in quarters into into games like Pac-Man and Space Invaders and other early games. Um, and I did that for years. I, I grew up in the arcade. I would take my entire allowance and go blow it at the arcade. And some of my favorite games at the time, I remember, I mean, again, I don't remember what order these were in or what years, but I remember playing Tron. I remember playing the hell out of uh, Star Wars, the original arcade game. I remember playing the hell out of Punch-Out! Marble Madness was one of my favorites. Crystal Castles. Uh, of course, I played the hell out of Pole Position. That's what got me started on racing games. And, you know, there were quite a few others. Anything that had new technology, I loved it. Dragon's Lair, even though it's a crap game, if you play it today, it sucks. But at the time, it was amazing to me. Here you had real cartoon graphics in an arcade game. The most advanced video game you can play is awaiting your discovery at Showbiz Pizza Place. The princess is held captive, and only the brave knight, Dirk the Daring, can save her. With sophisticated laser disc animation, you'll move Dirk through the innumerable dangers of the enchanted castle to rescue the beautiful princess, Dragon's Lair, the supreme adventure in video games. 
Uh, I loved Star Rider for the same reason. That was another Laserdisc game. I only got to play that a few times because my local arcade didn't have it. Mach 3 was another great Laserdisc game. That was very similar to Afterburner, which is a game that I loved, but it was always too hard for me. At a certain point, arcade games did get a little more difficult than I feel like they should have been and that they were originally. But Mach 3 was similar to Afterburner, but it had Laserdisc-based graphics, which was really just a movie playing in the background, but looked great and was basically a rail shooter, so it lended itself really well to the Laserdisc format. But anything with new technology like that, trackballs, uh, I loved Centipede, uh, again, Marble Madness, which was, you know, anything on that Atari hardware, which had great sound, it was very innovative at the time. I still kind of feel that way today about games. You know, I gravitated towards VR. I have a video about VR if you want to look that up. I love sort of any kind of oddball technology, anything new, even if it's not adopted by others. I've always been that way. I feel like there's kind of a resistance to that now that we didn't have back in the old days. Anything that was new and different, we loved it. Even if it was only for a few games, we didn't care. We would go and we would spend our money every week on those games. So that's where I kind of came from as a gamer. In I, probably somewhere around 78, 79, I got my first game console. I always tell people my first console was an Intellivision, but it actually wasn't. My first game console was a Coleco Telstar Arcade. Now, that's kind of a forgotten system, and it's not really talked about in the same way as the fully programmable systems like the Intellivision, Atari VCS, others of that era, but it was kind of a first generation, sort of straddling the line between, I guess, first and second generation of video game consoles. I think I may have only ever had the one cartridge for it. I don't know what happened to that system. I had it for a very short time. And then the first real game console that I got was an Intellivision in 1980. And that kind of set me on the path to being a long-term console gamer, I guess. I played the hell out of that thing. I loved it. I still love it. I have a video just on the Intellivision if you want to check that out if you haven't already. And just to actually use a few of the props that I have behind me here, these were some of my favorite games at the time on the Intellivision. Space Battle, of course, uh, Major League Baseball, and Auto Racing. And not coincidentally at all, these are some of the same genres that I still love today. Now, around 82, 83, I actually don't remember the specific year that it came out, one of my friends right across the street got herself a ColecoVision and that was, I don't think that was actually my introduction to Nintendo. It was my introduction to Nintendo in the home, but Donkey Kong played the hell out of that. Uh, again, I do remember playing a lot of Nintendo games at the arcade. One of my favorites was Versus Tennis for some reason. I loved that. Of course, that developed into Mario Tennis later, but back then Nintendo was not all about Mario and Zelda. In fact, they had a lot of different games, and this is something that some of the commenters on some of my other videos haven't understood. I've owned pretty much every Nintendo system ever made, and I don't really like Mario games. I mean, I can't say that I don't like them. I They don't grab me. And a lot of people have questioned, well, why do you buy Nintendo stuff if you don't like Mario? Because I grew up at a time when Nintendo was not just about that. Nintendo did a lot of different things. They still do some different things, but they've sort of latched on to their mascots in the way that Disney did and kind of made everything about that now. Um, even games that aren't specifically about Mario, like Smash Brothers, have become basically about their characters. And they didn't have that back in the early 80s when I was growing up with them. It was just about finding different types of gameplay like every other great arcade game company. So that's kind of what I know of Nintendo and what I love about Nintendo. And I still expect that from them. And when I don't get it, I get kind of annoyed. And that's sort of the way that I've felt about their last couple of game systems. I do have a Switch, I'm giving it a chance, but we'll see where that goes. Now, as I grew older, of course, my tastes changed a little bit. Um, 
1985, I got my Apple II, which, again, I had wanted since 1977 when I saw that kid playing wizardry with all the cords hanging out and everything. I had wanted an Apple II. Um, I didn't get one until 1985. That was the first time we could afford one. The Apple IIc was more affordable than the IIe, which was what I really wanted. But IIc had everything that you would really need from the IIe, and it ran all the same software. So that's what we got. And I loved that, that machine. And I basically switched almost exclusively to playing computer games at that time. I've again shown off my Apple IIc, the same one that I had in 1985 in another video, if you want to check that out. And I still have a lot of my boxed software here. And again, you can see some of the same genres that I still follow today. Uh, we've got uh, some strategy games, some action games, some racing games, and the original John Madden football. Yes, it was an Apple II game. And I still play a lot of those same types of games now. Now, I liked computer gaming at that time for the same reasons that a lot of PC gamers argue that the PC is superior now. I felt it gave kind of a more in-depth experience. You could have something like a really deep strategy game on the Apple II that you couldn't have on especially the Intellivision, which by then I had basically put in a closet and forgotten about, but even on something like the NES. I got an NES for Christmas in 1985 from my mom. I didn't really want it. Um, to be honest, I didn't ask for it, and I did play it. I thought it was very nice that she bought it. She bought it. I appreciated it. I did play it as much as I could, <laughs> but just never got into it. And it, again, went into a closet. I had like five games for it, and that was it. At that time, I had switched exclusively basically over to the computer. I thought that was the future. That's all I want. I want these more complicated experiences. So... That's what I played up until about 1990, 1991. And what happened then is I went to college and things changed for me a lot in college. It's obviously a much more social atmosphere. I was living in a dorm and everybody in my dorm had some kind of game console. Now, some people did have NESs. At that point, it was kind of old hat, but a couple people did have it, and there were still some fun games for multiplayer on that system. Even at that time, uh, I do remember playing a lot of uh, Dodgeball, which was amazing. That is an amazing multiplayer game on the NES, and that kind of got me back into consoles, I guess, and uh, a couple people had Genesis is Genesis in my dorm and I ended up buying a used one off one of those guys and we played a lot of sports games uh, because that's kind of what guys do when they all get together in a college dorm I guess we we had a blockbuster near us and at that time they were renting games think of all the mature responsible things you could be doing Maybe. helping old ladies cross the street hanging with your phones or cleaning your room but get real. You'd rather be playing video games. You can rent them from Blockbuster. So I rented a ton of games. I actually played a ton of different games for that Genesis. Fell in love with the Genesis. Obviously got really into Sonic like every Genesis owner. And really developed kind of an appreciation and love again for Sega. Sega! Who I had been following since, uh, since the arcades back in the early 80s. Obviously with Star Wars and, you know, Star Trek and other games like that. But the Genesis kind of gave me what I wanted at that time, which was action-based, basically simple games that could kind of take me out of my schoolwork, which is what you kind of need when you're in a college dorm and you've got all this stuff going on. Your brain is kind of being compressed from all sides and you just need kind of an escape. The Genesis did that for me. So really got back into console gaming at that point. And since then, I've kind of been doing a mix of both. And shortly after college, I got my first job in the video game industry, which was writing about video games for a website, which I've talked about before, so I'm not gonna get that into it, but worked in the industry for a while, both writing about games and then for Rockstar Games. And at that point, I was kind of at the 
peak of my involvement, I guess, obviously in the industry, because I was in the industry, but also with just gaming in general. At that time, I was standing in line for all of the new console releases. I owned every current console. I had a gaming PC. Uh, I, I was just playing games constantly, both at work. I, I worked in marketing, but we did have to test the games. And uh, you know everybody in the company for the big games was pressed into testing. We also played a lot of games after hours. Played a ton of Serious Sam, played some Unreal Tournament, and then I would go home and I would play things like Silent Hill, uh, Silent Hill 2, which was probably my favorite game at that time. And I just, I basically never stopped playing games at that time. It, my whole life was just about video games. At the same time, arcades by this point had basically faded completely out. One of my favorite systems of all time, certainly at that time, but even today, is still the Dreamcast, and that's because it was kind of the last arcade-based system. It took me back to my roots, and I still feel that way today. Sega was still doing the same kinds of things on the Dreamcast as arcade game makers were in the 80s. It was more about finding new gameplay styles than it was about just fitting things into little boxes in terms of genres and just making things more complex, which I feel like is one of the things that a lot of game makers do today. So I had kind of lamented the demise of the Dreamcast, but I had moved on by that point to the PS2 and had made my life basically all about video games, both on consoles and PCs. As you can imagine, at a certain point, when you're working in the industry and playing games basically every waking hour of the day otherwise, it gets to be a little too much. And I was trying to keep up with everything going on in the industry. And it just, it got to be almost overwhelming. And I ended up quitting that job, moved on to working in a related but different industry. And started kind of pulling back, I guess, from wanting to be up on literally every single thing that was going on. These days, you can look at a website like Kotaku, which is a site that I used to read religiously, and it just all seems so trivial to me right now. It's just, the stuff they talk about just doesn't mean anything to anybody. I mean, I'll just take a random smattering of headlines right now and show them to you, and you can see what I mean. It's, it's just, I mean, and this is the kind of thing that I used to follow and think was very important. Anyway, this is just one of those things that I can't do anymore. It's something that I know a lot of modern gamers do. They follow every little tidbit of information, every little thing about some object, some character might have in a game. I mean, I, I just, I can't, I can't do it. Like, it's, who cares? I mean... I know right now, because I talked about getting Forza 7 for the Xbox One X in, uh, in one of my other Patreon posts, actually, and uh, I know there's this big controversy about that right now with loot crates. Uh, loot crates are these kind of... Uh, it's a free-to-play kind of whatever thing that, you know, it's a way, basically, for them to get more money from you after you've already bought the game. and. You know, I didn't even know really much about it before, and I read a bit about it, and, you know, it's like, who cares? I mean, just why do you need to be outraged about every little thing, you know? Just play the damn game and enjoy it. That's what we used to do, and that's what I still do. I buy games. If I don't like them, I don't like them. If I like them, I like them. I don't care about every little stupid thing, and... That is one way the games have changed and the way the industry has changed and the way the industry's fans have changed. And maybe that's just something that you kind of grow out of as you get older, but I honestly don't remember it being that way when I was younger. And part of it is probably the internet, which we didn't have when I was younger. We had magazines and, you know, you would read something in a magazine and if you wanted to talk about it with somebody, all you could talk about it with was whoever happened to be sitting next to you. So there didn't get to be this collective sort of outrage about things like loot crates or this weird sort of fetishism of 
certain features of games or certain characters or whatever. We all just kind of played what was out there and judged for ourselves individually whether we liked something or not. And th things became popular or not organically. So that's kind of one big negative change, I think, that's happened over the years. And it, it honestly keeps me from being quite as invested in games or the industry as I used to be. And that, that kind of sucks. Now, something else that's happened, which I think probably is pretty universal, is that I've just, I've got a lot less time than I used to have. Games have kind of followed an evolution where they started out extremely simple, right? I mean, we had Pong back in 1972. I didn't mention that before, but I, I did play Pong in the arcades before I played pretty much anything else. You know, I, I never really liked it that much, but it was there. And that's kind of the simplest game you can imagine. It's just a paddle hitting the ball back and forth. From there, we went to having, you know, semi-realistic baseball games like I had on the Intellivision, basketball games, other sports. Uh, and then we had kind of realistic tennis games like Mario Tennis or Versus Tennis before that. And same thing happened with strategy games. We can simulate a full war now in our computers and with all that that entails. The first time I played Close Combat, I was blown away because it simulates individual soldiers and even the feelings that they have on the battlefield and how well they're going to fight based on how scared they are and things like that. I mean, that's amazing. And that was amazing to me at the time and it's still kind of amazing to me now. But at some point, games got really, really, really complex. And, you know, I can't even really play Madden anymore. The very first Madden was very simple. You picked a play, there were a couple buttons, and that's it. Now, there's so many different things you can do and different button combinations, and I can't even remember them all. And consequently, I haven't bought a Madden game in, I don't know, five, six years. So games have gotten way more complex than I want them to be for, for the most part, and they take too long for me to get into too long for me to get anything out of, and I just don't have the time anymore. This is something that happens as you get older. I have a job. It's a job that takes a lot of my time, including a lot of my home time. It's one reason why I can't do more videos, but I also do these videos. And I just don't have time to sit there and sink my teeth into one of these giant strategy games or even most modern sports games. Now I do like some. One of my favorite games of the past year or so is MLB The Show 17. And that's just, it's its the kind of game where you, it's almost more of an RPG in that you're building something. You're building a team or you're building your own character or whatever. And those games I do, they do kind of still suck me in. And whether it's a sports game or a city building game or, you know, I kind of try to avoid real traditional role playing games because I know they're going to take a lot of time. But something like MLB The Show, which I do end up probably putting a lot of hours into, but I can just stop playing any time that I want. You know, I play one game and then I can stop. So that's kind of what I look for today is any game that can be enjoyed in bite sized chunks. Even if it's kind of a bigger game, I don't want to have to spend 15 hours before I even kind of get to the main story or whatever. And that's a problem that a lot of traditional RPGs have these days. I want to sit down as soon as I put in the game. I'm playing. I'm into it. I'm totally invested. And I can stop whenever I want. And that kind of takes me back to the arcade style games that I started out with. So I actually do think that's one of the reasons for the big retro game craze that's going on right now. Um, it's definitely a reason why I'm into a lot of the classic games that I am and that I always was really, but I've kind of gotten back to that. And I know that the industry is taking notice because they've, they've done a lot of things to kind of pay lip service to people who are into retro games. There are a lot of products out there now you know, whether it's the emulation systems from At Games, whether it's the NES Classic and the SNES Classic. You know, there's a lot of products out there that are catering to people who are looking for those 
simpler bite-sized games, but hopefully with this acknowledgement that the industry has had to retro gamers recently, hopefully there will be some similar changes to modern games as well. And I know there are going to be people out there that are going to say, look to Nintendo, this is what they do. And to an extent, it's true. And I, I've played a lot of Mario Kart on my Switch. I love it. Um, but, you know, they're guilty of a lot of this as well. I, you know, I. some people are going to think this is blasphemy, but I just could not get into the last Zelda game. It, it's another one of those games that didn't grab me immediately, and I just couldn't keep playing it for long enough for it to do so. So... I'd love to support them. They're the last pure gaming company, really. And they're the last company making hardware, at least from the time that I first started playing video games and arcade games. Well, shortly after, anyway. They weren't doing it in 1977, 78, but um, I guess 81 or 82 might have been their first arcade game. And of course, they had the Game & Watch and all that. Uh, this is a repro, by the way, but I did play the originals at the time. So, sort of a long outro, I guess, but that's about it for now. And, uh, you know, I'm sure a lot of you disagree with some of the things that I've said, but a lot of you hopefully agree. And even if you disagree, maybe you found it interesting. This is just kind of my perspective as a 45-year-old guy who grew up playing video games over the last 40 years. And, you know, this is what has happened to my perspective on things as I've gotten older. So that's it for now, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.